Hi my friends, welcome to Revive Anime and Games the Initiated Zone. For today we're going back to video game reviews and we've got one that I've been really anticipating, Super Robot Wars V. I miss the days when we could call it Super Robot Tyson. I mean, to me Tyson just sounds so much more unique and powerful in a way. I mean really, where's there ever been anything objectively awful with Tyson in the title? Okay, okay, I get it. Jeez. By the way, who's directing and writing the next one? No, no, do the review first, do the review first! Much like the Moon Dwellers OG games I reviewed, this title was also released in Asian countries like Singapore where English is a major language. Thus, even though this wasn't created for a North American audience, it's almost perfectly playable for us here in the States. I say almost, but we'll get into those details in a bit. First, let's take a look at... This was an interesting roster to say the least. Now first of all, we've got all the standards. One or two Majin Gars, a Gare Robo, maybe a Brave series, though surprisingly not Gal Gygar this time, but instead Mike Gain, and a bunch of UC Gundams. But then there were the Gundams no one was expecting. Crossbow makes a surprise return after over a decade since Alpha 2, yeah he didn't even appear in Alpha 3, and all of a sudden he's back with more characters and story no less. Hathaway's Flash, a Gundam novel series that didn't even get an anime or manga adaptation was really unexpected, especially since, by my research, it's not even really considered canon by its creators. Still, it's not as though those guys really felt out of place in this game. Now, Shin Gar Zero, the manga reboot of the original story, that could have gone out of some people's comfort zone, shall we say. Yeah, I haven't found complete scanlations of it yet, but based on some plot summaries I've read, I can say it goes a little... devil ish Now I'll admit, there are some insanely awesome moments in that manga, but also some disagreeable elements that I'm kind of glad they didn't include in this game. Besides, we already have cross Ange for stuff like that. Yeah, personally one of the series I was the most looking forward to see debut was cross Ange. In my opinion, one of the absolute Best bad anime ever. And no, I'm not ashamed to own these Blu-rays. The other one I and many others were excited to see was of course freaking Yamato 2199. Yep, the remake of arguably one of the greatest anime space operas ever has actually joined the Super Robot Wars roster. Again, an unusual case when you consider Yamato has no big robots to go to war with. Just the titular battleship, which does look good alongside the other ship units, and sometimes a dinky little plane unit, but still the Yamato itself is a really damn strong unit and probably one of my favorite new battleships in this game series, and its story is pretty well integrated, but more on that later. Also, the Great Machine Guard here is slightly different origins than previous incarnations, but I won't go into exact details about it as it falls into spoiler territory. But I will say this is probably one of my favorite versions of the pilot and the mech. In fact, I think I ultimately like a lot of these new guys, with some of them like Mike Guy and Wimmy over as to why they deserve to be in these games. As for everyone else, they give me a slight case of deja vu. Again, more on that later, but first let's talk about the OG characters. This game sports two playable leads, Soji Murakumo and Chitose Kisaragi, and they both pretty much play out the same. Yes, they both have their own unique personalities and interactions with the other characters, but at the end of the day, they both go through the same major plot points, they both use the same machine, and both later upgrade that machine into either a full-on super robot, or a full-on real robot much like Crow from the Z2 games. Now I'm not saying every super robot game has to be like Alpha 3, and I just want to let you know that you're not really missing out on much when you pick one over the other. That is, unless you really want to see more of Chitose and her ridiculous outfit. Seriously, I do like Chitose, especially for her relationship with another character we're about to talk about. But, lady, if you're going to even bother with a necktie, maybe you should also learn how to wear a proper shirt and pants! Also, give Shimikaze back her G-string. Anyway, pointless fan service aside, the major constant between their two stories was the other main character of this game, System 99, or just 9 as everyone calls her. Nine is the AI of the mech piloted by the main character that plopped itself into an android body, and honestly, she's become one of my favorite OG characters ever. 
I don't know, maybe it's just because they have a thing for Frosty Lolis. They even point out at one point that she acts a lot like a younger Rui Hoshino. Still, her interactions with everyone, especially the OG main characters, are touching. And seeing her become friends with other AIs like Al from FMP and the Brave Express team was fun. The other two OG main characters you might be able to get to join your team are Velt and Lot, the pilots of the Huckabine and Grungus respectively. I say might, because in order to get them, you do have to input a DLC code only available in first editions of this game. Oh, also this code will only be accepted through Southeast Asia region accounts. So if you do end up buying this game, I highly recommend picking up the PS4 version, as the PS4 at least allows you to have multiple accounts on your machine, unlike my stupid Vita. I set up a Singapore account, and thankfully it was all in English, so it wasn't a hard process. It is a shame that all of the trophies I've won in this game aren't in my main account, but I can live without them. That said, I will always be against the very idea of having content like this locked off through DLC. It just reminds me too much of like when Catwoman was locked off for anyone who buy used copy of Arkham City, even though she played such a major part in that game's story. And while I could see Velt and Lot's parts cut, why would you honestly want that? They're fun characters who pilot classic SRW machines. The Huckabye in particular was something no one was ever expected to see again because of legal spouts with Sunrise. Sorry for going off on a little bit of a tangent there, I just hope this doesn't become a regular thing for this franchise. Otherwise, it'll bring serious credence to Presto Mask being a thing. Because otherwise, this was a very solid roster, redundancy aside. Not the best in the franchise, but ultimately all of the series complement one another pretty well. Still, I think it's about time we finally address the biggest issue myself and others have with this title. Okay, now where did I put the game? Oh, here it is, uh, wait, are PS4 discs usually this light? Oh, here it is. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between these two. Yeah, unfortunately, this is one of those cases where recycling has led to the creation of something not exactly the most structurally sound when it comes to this game's graphics. Many of the returning roster members in this game were a part of the Z3 games, more than likely because they wanted to use the same engine. Now granted, they have tweaked it a little bit to make things look a little bit crisper, and even redid some animations, and then did absolutely nothing for others like the Gundam 00 guys. And need I remind you, the Z3 games didn't even look that good on the PS3, and this is the PS4. Still, I guess it's not all bad. For one thing, they got rid of those god-awful head icons on the map, and replaced them with full body icons. Yeah, they're small, but at least they look identifiable. Some of the animations for the new series are also pretty sweet, like the Yamato Signature Wave Motion Gun, Vilkus' Ability Unlock, and pretty much all of the attacks of the new Machine Guards. And they're all accompanied with fantastic instrumental versions of each of their main themes that almost makes me wish I had splurged for the more expensive edition that include the soundtrack. Almost. Jeez. Surprisingly though, the biggest standout of this game's presentation was the English translations. Previously, I said that the English in Moondwellers was... passable. I mean, like, if I were an English teacher, I might give this game a B-, and that's me being generous. For this game though... I'd give it a straight A. It's not perfect, as I do think I saw some occasional errors, but then forgot about them just as quickly because they were so minor. They incorporated appropriate slang when needed, and even made me look up a few words. I don't think I've even done that with North American release titles. This asshole doesn't acknowledge the fidelity of the CQBZ. I hate him and his stupid nose! Still Excellent writing. Sure, aside from Boltakun, they disregarded all the honorifics. But if it's a choice between bare weeaboo appeal or grammar, I always choose grammar. So while Moon Dweller still does have better graphics, at least I can read this one better. I don't like Hey guys, remember how OP the tag tension system in the Z3 games were? Well, screw that noise and check out this new game breaking system. Okay, I'm exaggerating. The extra command system is not nearly as OP in my opinion, as there are more limiters and less commands to abuse, even though it does still maintain the multi-action command which allows one unit to make more than one move per turn as long as it keeps destroying enemies. Another sort of spiritual successor to a system from the Tengoku head is tactical point customization. Again, this isn't nearly as game-breaking as the Z-Crystal, 
but I would still recommend prioritizing spending your tactical points on it. Oh yeah, tactical points by the way are what are replacing pilot points in this game. For those unfamiliar, pilot points are what pilots earn individually through leveling up. Tactical points are similar, except instead of being earned individually, they're shared amongst all the pilots. Meaning that you could score points with your stronger guys, and then during intermissions share those points with the guys who didn't even participate in the battle to buffer their stats and even grant new skills. Those same points are also used to buy machine parts from the factory, so there's a lot of ways to approach this game. I overall really like this new system, as it's essentially encouraging creating a more balanced team. You can still focus on using the guys you like, while also maintaining some stronger lower tier guys when you do eventually have to use them during different route splits. This is helped by the fact that the suborders from the Z games has also returned. Now, while this system is overall balanced in my opinion, the difficulty unfortunately is a little bit on the lower tier. This is mainly because even in hard mode, I found the enemies to be surprisingly weak. Meanwhile, you got some of the better pilots and mechs to ever grace a Super Robot Wars game. And to top all that off, Spirit Commands can now be activated at any time, even during the opponent's turn. I activate this card! Well, I activate this card! Then I activate this card! Then I activate this card! Activate this card! I activate this! Well, I activate this! Now, of course, just because a game's easy doesn't necessarily mean it's not enjoyable. Between this and Moon Dwellers, this might be a slightly more comfortable starting point for anyone unfamiliar with the franchise. It eases the player in and keeps the gameplay engaging enough, and while the difficulty curve does kinda of pander off in the latter half of the game, it still has its fair share of awesome moments, which we'll discuss in... Hmm... Not quite as insane as this multiverse, but you're getting there. Yeah, it figures they pull out the good old multiverse card when you consider the series involved in this title. Though surprisingly, it's only separated into three universes, just three. Granted, the series in each universe are woven together in interesting ways, with stuff like the Yamato's war with the Gamillions being what spurs the OG main character to action. Though I'm not completely sold on cross and sharing a universe with pretty much any other series. It kind of undermines the whole Normas being victims of inescapable xenophobia drama, when pretty much every nation outside of their birthplace will be willing to accept them as Moogles. Whatever, they do end up tying all the conflicts in their universe pretty nicely together, along with the overarching conflict involving the fate of the other two universes. I'm just a sucker when it comes to these stories involving the possible destruction of multiple universes, as it really ups the stakes. It's made even better when you get guys like Embryo, Leonard, and Desler all working together. It's honestly pretty amazing to see such a lineup of absolute scum. It's a pity that the OG villains kind of end up getting lost in the shuffle though. I don't know, after Moon Dwellers, these guys just came off as pretty bland, and after following an act involving some of the biggest narcissistic assholes in all of anime, they just kind of left no real impact. That aside, this is still a pretty epic story, worthy of being at the end of a long trilogy, which it really does feel like at times because they skipped a ton of story with most of the real robot series reaching their respective climaxes before the game even starts. I mean, come on, who out there doesn't want to see Destiny play out in its entirety? <coughs> yeah, even though this game did trim a lot of good story, it also got rid of some less favorable storylines. Most notably, the entirety of Ava 3.0. Yeah, it's listed as being part of the roster, but only really because two units from that film are in the game. And as a result of stopping right before the shark jumped, we got one of the most badass incarnations of Shinji Ikari ever. As you can kind of tell by this game's cover, the Berserk Unit 1 is indeed a playable unit. And that's because the Shinji in this game actually managed to gain total control over it. Damn, these games really do some favors for Shinji Ikari of all people. And that to me is what a good crossover should do, have all the heroes and heroines develop thanks to interactions with one another. Hell, I even love all the little interactions like Anne saying that Setsuna has a good voice right after meeting Tusk for the first time. Because yeah, we all know that Mamoru Miyano has a truly heavenly voice. Best of all, they include my dream match of Bontakun vs. Peril Lickety. Lickety? No! 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 It's Perilina, not Lickety! She's not some evolution of Lickitung or something like that! That's it, zero stars, I'm done, see ya! <sighs> okay, okay, I guess I'll get over it. 
In the end, it's all good stuff that kept me engaged in the conflict in spite of some minor hangups. In spite of some glaring flaws and some poor choices in names, <clears throat> I overall did have a really good time with this title. Between this and Moondwellers, it's just nice to see this franchise tailoring to more international audiences, whether completely intentional or not. On the positive side of things, the roster while not exactly large is very colorful with plenty of series for both nostalgic and modern crowds. The interplay between said series is pretty fun with them exchanging some inspiring words and more importantly good banter. The new gameplay systems are fairly well balanced and I hope we get to see them in future games. And of all things, the English translations here are surprisingly really good and even kinda smart at times. On the flip side of that, while the characters are great, it almost feels like we've skipped a ton of their character development, with several real robot series closing in on their respective climaxes. While the gameplay systems are well crafted, the actual difficulty here might be a little too easy for some, and we're unfortunately still mostly using a game engine that didn't even look all that good on the PS3. While certainly not the best looking or playing SRW game ever, I would say this is an admirable first step for the mainline games on a new console and in a new language. As such, I'm giving it the same score I gave the Moon Dwellers with 4 Yamatos out of 5, but for anyone new to the franchise, I would recommend picking this one up over Moon Dwellers if only for the better English translations. And while the difficulty might be a little too easy for experienced strategy RPG gamers, it might also be a good introduction to these game systems, especially if this is the template they're going to use from now on. Either way, you really can't go wrong with either of these titles, and hopefully we'll get to see more games like these that'll justify me now having a Singapore PSN account. I think another minor complaint I might have is the fact that Perolina, not Linkagee dammit, isn't a playable unit. I mean, the story bit between her and Boltacoon was nice and everything, but I'd kill to be able to play through that fight. Hell, throw in a third guy just to make it a triple threat. Boy, wouldn't that be a more interesting match than what might be the main event of this year's WrestleMania. Still, until that fateful meeting, look forward to my next video, and farewell for now my friends. Thank <laughs> you.